There we are. That's it. Well done. Okay, I should be in presentation mode now. Yep, it's all there. It's all there. It's, um, it's okay. Well, I'm 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 continuing in in my area of philately and international mail order fraud uh, today, highlighting a variety of French connections, and uh, as you will see, this is actually a, a joint presentation by uh, Loic and myself, uh, where he's uh, worked along with me on on uh, helping to gather the information that that I'll be presenting. Uh, uh, this afternoon for you. Uh, of course, it, it relates to my favorite American professor, Professor A. Victor Segno. Uh, just a, a short introduction in case people uh, haven't heard about Professor Segno before. Uh, he began an international mail order fraud scam from his offices in Los Angeles in 1900. For $10 a year, which is about $200 in today's purchasing power, one could join his success club and receive success waves twice a day. And clients' lives would, would improve in the areas noted above in the above ad. And by 1903, he already had 12,000 members of his success club receiving his success waves. And I've seen a claim that he had 70,000 members uh, by 1911, but I've not been able to verify that, that claim. So we have that little bit of an introduction to Professor Segno. And uh, I found this cover on eBay uh, earlier in the year, in the spring of this year. And I began wondering if, if this was an unusual Segno cover with a variety of French connections. Uh, the cover was purchased from eBay. It was posted from a place called Inspiration Point in Los Angeles in 1912 to France. It was received in the little village of uh, Preti in France on April 23rd. I thought that a very significant arrival as April 23rd is my birthday. Uh, so I felt I had to add this cover to my collection. It was readdressed from Pretty three days later uh, to one Madame A. Louise Evans back at Inspiration Point. It seems that the outbound rate was one, Amer one American cent and the inbound rate back to LA was 40 French centimes. Both are unusual rates. Uh, the US-France rate was five cents in 1912, and the French-US rate was 25 centimes. And, and I thought this was going to be a, a, a wandering journey uh, that was going to lead many places. So I asked Loic to join with me in trying to unravel this cover in all of its and related aspects. I should also note, you can see the Preti arrival from the 23rd of April, 1912 on the back. And so uh, Loic joined, joined in in the fray and we started working on this cover. And if you look at it closely, it really looks like it's a one cent US rate. There doesn't seem to be any other stamps. No stamps have been removed. And it's very clearly a 40 centime French rate, and there are two addresses on it. Uh, you'll note a little hole here. Uh, even that little hole has a has a little significance uh, in this uh, in this story. So uh, we decided to uh, uh, unravel this cover and see what we could learn about it. So the first question is inspiration point. Uh, what and where? Okay, it's the return address. Is that affiliated in any way with Professor Segno? And that proved to be a very uh, easy, easy question to ask because in my collection, I had this duplex postcard, which I showed last time when I spoke about Professor Segno. And you will note it's uh, the return address is Inspiration Point, Echo Park, Los Angeles, California. Uh, what it is, is a duplex postcard 
uh, at the one centime, oh, pardon me, one cent printed matter rate, uh, which would carry up to two ounces of mail uh, in the U.S. and overseas. You should also note the dateless date stamp that just says Los Angeles 1908. Uh, that is a, a typical type of U.S. date stamp for printed matter. And the return address is Inspiration Point. And if you look at the left to see the, the small vignette, it's Professor Segno. If you seek success, write to the Segno Success Club. So that clearly associates Inspiration Point with Segno. But if you turn the card over, uh, the association becomes even more fast. Uh, you see at the lower right a picture of his buildings, the front one being the American Institute of Mentalism, home of the Success Club located at Inspiration Point, Echo Park, Los Angeles, California. And then the picture at the upper left is the gardens that are associated with these buildings, uh, which, are, which are known as Inspiration Point. So that, that really ties this cover to Professor Segno. I should note in the background, uh, this lake here is, is Echo Park Lake, uh, the home of a famous park in, in Los Angeles today. Uh, just to make the association even, even better, I looked through my uh, Segno covers collection. I have a little uh, close to 300 now. And there was a clear association in one address with Professor Segno and Inspiration Point. Uh, so I think that, that makes the argument quite certain. And we can say the outgoing rate appears to be the same one cent printed matter rate Per two ounces that I've that I've already shown, you can see the one cent U.S. Franklin stamp and and no other U.S. U.S. stamps on the uh, uh, on the envelope. If you uh, backlight the envelope, you can actually see the the full Los Angeles cancellation on it. Here's the the printed matter piece that I previous I've already shown you. You see the Los Angeles state stamp with with no date, and you can see on the on the envelope it's Los Angeles, uh, California, no date. It's 1912 here. Of course, it's 1908 here, and you see the rest of the cancellation is undulating lines, and there's a two and a C here. These are informational markings used by the U.S. Post Office. I won't go into them, but if you look at the cancel on the subject cover. You can see the two, and you can see the C. So this is uh, a very similar or identical, save for the date, uh, uh, printed matter cancellation on the outgoing envelope uh, from Los Angeles to, to the village of Preti. So the conclusion is this envelope was a standard outgoing information package from the American Institute of Mentalism and the Segno Success Club at the one, one cent printed matter rate. Uh, I can guess at the probable contents. There was typically these have a letter of introduction, an application blank for membership in the Success Club, an order form for books that Segno was selling in support of his activities, and importantly, a pre-addressed return envelope, and these were either printed or typed, for mailing back to Los Angeles for potential clients to uh, uh, gain access to the organization. Uh, here's a typical one cent uh, uh, printed matter envelope uh, uh, with the Los Angeles, California station E cancel. The address at the top is the actual address of Segno's buildings, which are 701 and 703 North Belmont Avenue. And Segno sent out literally thousands of these informational envelopes every week to, to potential clients. Uh, but as printed matter, few have survived. And in fact, this is, uh, this is the only one I've seen uh, thus far, plus, plus the one I'm talking about. Uh, so uh, what, what might have been in the envelope going, going out to France? Uh, Duke University maintains a virtual uh, collection of U.S. advertising from the Revolutionary War days until 1950. And if you search the 1910 
1910 to 1920 period, you find this advertisement from the Segno Success Club, uh, where he was offering a month's free, free treatment of charge. This was a typical enclosure in, in an outgoing envelope to clients. You can see in the center uh, a, a couple of paragraphs uh, demonstrating the wonderful power in mentalism. And then on the right, an order form. Uh, this, this ad was offering a month's free treatment, and you can see in the order form, I desire treatment for, and you could fill in uh, whatever was bothering you. But in reality, it was an order form for his book, The Law of Mentalism, uh, which he was charging, I think it's $3. Uh, and then you can see at the, at the bottom uh, uh, right side, there are testimonials from, from happy clients. Uh, so that's the type of advertising that was frequently included. Uh, this is just two copies of the Law of Mentalism. It was published in all the major European languages. The one at the left is is uh, in German, published by his uh, Success Club branch in Berlin. And the one at the right is a French translation that was done 10 years after Segno's death. Uh, this was uh, the French one was published in 1950, a new edition, uh, just showing the influence that he he was having uh, with his with his ideas of mentalism and and success. Uh, this is a typical return envelope. The pre-addressed envelope was included in the package, as I said, either typed or printed. This one is to Annie Del Segno. Uh, in 1914, his former wife, who is still treasurer of the American Institute of Mentalism, Professor Segno was off in Berlin in 1914, working on the German branch. And, and this is uh, typical of, of return mail to the Segno organization. It's from the small village of Argensis in France, uh, 1914, very nicely franked with a proper combination of sewer issues at the 50 centime registered rate. Uh, and that meant it contained some sort of monetary vehicle. Someone was either joining the success club or ordering one of Segno's, uh, Segno's books. And here's a, a, a photo of the town of Argensis. And uh, it makes the point that most of the mail to the Segno organization is not from the major cities of each country that that uh, show this mail, but from the very the much smaller cities, really towns and and villages where Segno was much more successful. So, uh, we've established the envelope as as coming from the Segno organization. The next question is who was the addressee and what can we learn about her. And the addressee is written in, in black manuscript and is crossed out. Uh, and the actual addressee is Mademoiselle Lucie Gautier uh, at the Chateau de Pendant uh, near Tournou uh, in the Saône and Loire uh, uh, department in France. And you can see uh, some way, somewhere along the way in France, somebody added Preti in manuscript, probably a postal clerk. And Preti is a, is a small commune or village in eastern France uh, between Dijon and uh, Lyon. Uh, and again, just, just to show you the, uh, the back stamp. So uh, uh, Loic was on the job at, at this point, and, and one of the first things he did was search Delcamp for the Chateau de Pendant, and this postcard came up. And you'll see it says at the top in the area of Tournou, Preti, the Chateau de Pendant from the 19th century. And the owner is Madame Gautier. Uh, so that was that was a big, a big hit. Uh, of course, this is not Chenin So or Chambord. This is just a, a, a simple, maybe manor house, uh, three stories, uh, and, and an outer building for uh, storage. Uh, but that's the Chateau Pendant where Madame or Mademoiselle uh, Gautier uh, lived. Uh, with with Loic success, I went to eBay and uh, to see if I could find a, a postcard from the Chateau de Pendant. And uh, I found this one, which is simply a, a closer picture of the actual building. 
And this one was actually mailed in, in Preti, not by Lucy Gautier, though, uh, but, but uh, it's, it's a nice period piece, 1912, uh, showing, showing the chateau. So uh, who was Mademoiselle Lucy Gautier? Uh, Loic uh, started digging in, in French sources and found that Lucy Gautier was born on September 9th, 1882, and she died on uh, April 17th, 1917, at a mere 34 years of age. She was the daughter of Henri Simon Gautier, owner of the Chateau de Lux Corton in Burgundy, and one Maria del Vaffier. Uh, I, I quickly googled the Lux Corton to see what kind of chateau it is, and as you can see, it's it's quite a fashionable chateau. Uh, they make a Premier Cru uh, Burgundy, a Pinot Noir wine, which costs about sixty dollars a bottle. And were this a live presentation uh, rather than a virtual presentation, I think it would be incumbent on Loic and I at this point to call a break in the meeting and serve everyone a glass of Alox Corton. Uh, fortunately for us, it's a virtual meeting, so we have to don't have to uh, uh, take on the cost of providing everybody with a nice glass of Chateau Alox Corton. So continuing on with, with Lucy, in 1912, she published two novels, one, two romance novels, Unnecessary Will, and fate leads us. And she became a member of the Academy de Macon, a society dedicated to arts, science, and literature. And at this point, Loic, Loic speculated uh, uh, to me, it, it is quite possible that the pseudo-scientific approach of Segno's American Institute of Mentalism found in Lucy Gautier a somewhat receptive spirit. Uh, Maybe one of Segno's publications appealed to her and, and of his list of about a dozen, I could see the law of mentalism into this world and why, how to live a hundred years, force invisible or the psychic thief, personal magnetism or the secret of memory. Uh, any one of those could, could, could have appealed to, uh, to Lucy. Uh, here are copies from the web of, of her two books that I had just mentioned. One, a nice, uh, nicely bound copy in, in an older binding, and the one at the right, a more, more modern copy, noting it reached the, uh, the, third, the third edition. Uh, I found on eBay uh, uh, Lucy Gautier's uh, book plate, a uh, beautiful uh, 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 Art Nouveau style uh, book plate, and, and I was happy to purchase that for a, for a small sum. It reminded me of book plates, and I, I just want to take a little detour and show you Ed Grabowski's book plate. Uh, 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 back when my wife and I were newly married, she got this, I think, for our first or second anniversary, a whole stack of these. And you can see that in my, in my professional career, I was somewhat of a chemist, and uh, this was her view of, of my chem chemistry laboratory. Uh, so let's get back to Lucy Gautier. Uh, Loic found this portrait uh, on the web uh, that was painted in Cannes in 1904 by one Princess Anina Gar Garin Strutza, a Russian painter, uh, Odessa 1865, Cannes 1918. And here's a picture of, of our, our Lucy. And of course, you can see she's quite well to do. That's a most fashionable dress. And she has a very, I don't know if it's a sad or a very contemplative look uh, on her face as if she's quite a, quite a serious person. This painting was sold in 2007 at the Hotel Drouot uh, on the Rue Drouot in, in Paris. I'm sure many of you have visited the uh, Rue Drouot and, and all of its stamp collectors. Uh, we've not been able to determine the purchaser or the price uh, for this painting, uh, but definitely sold on the on the Rue Drouot. Loic also found some found the obituary of Lucy Gautier in the uh, uh, annals of the Academy de Macon, 
Uh, and you can see she was born in Cusary on September 9th, 1982, died in Paris in 1917. And the uh, Academy notes she was endowed with a rare intelligence. The greatest of her pleasures was to indulge in literary works and to write what her talent for observation and beautiful imagination inspired her. It is to this reason we owe the pleasure of having been able to read her two novels, which I've already uh, mentioned. They note that the books are highly appreciated and have been a legitimate success, especially the second, which is in its third edition. They also note she left manuscripts of several plays and an important work entitled Towards Calm, whose main attraction takes place in the city of Macomb. The war did not allow her to publish it, uh, but we hope one day the case it will be the case and they'll have the pleasure of reading, uh, reading her new novel. The society was honored to have her as a full member and her untimely death uh, brought, brought all deep regret. So it's a very, very nice obituary and, and sort of sad noting the death of, of such a young person. So why did you, Lucy reuse this envelope? In fact, we can never know for sure, but let's take some guesses. Possibly she had already used the pre-addressed return envelope to initiate some business with the Success Club, maybe membership, and then decided that the Segno ideas were of such great interest to her that she wanted to order a copy of one of his books, most probably The Law of Mentalism, which was published in, in French. Uh, she readdressed the incoming envelope, added an order form or letter noting her interest, placed 15 francs in cash, which was about $3 at the time, in the envelope with some cardboard sheets to protect the contents. And then she either realized or the post office told her that it had reached the second weight level, which required the use of 40 centimes to prepay the postage back to the United States. I'm watching DCAMP on uh, uh, eBay very carefully for a signal letter from 1912 posted in Preti, hoping someday to find uh, Lucy's original return envelope that was in the package. I should note it's well established that the Segno organization sold incoming foreign covers to the philatelic trade of the time, uh, uh, i.e. the subject cover of this presentation. So. We're now on the inbound journey to Los Angeles. The, this, the story continues. The address of Lucy Gautier was crossed out in black and the letter was readdressed in violet ink. It was frank that 40 centimes with sewer issues, that's for a double weight letter weighing 15 to 30 grams, posted from Preti on April 26, 1912, three days after arrival, and definitely sent back to the Segno organization. The addressee is Madam A. Louise Evans, Inspiration Point, Echo Park, Los Angeles, California, United States. And we have personal uh, encircled uh, here by, uh, by Lucy uh, in sending it back. One, one added proof that's, that's uh, kind of interesting, at least to me, the, even that hole that I showed you before is important. Uh, if you take typical Segno letters, uh, the, the contents of the letter were often pinned to the envelope. Here's a Segno letter from a small village in France uh, going back to him probably requesting information. And if you backlight it, you can see pinholes. And they used to pin the envelopes to the contents so as not to lose information and I think this whole represents where this envelope was pinned to the contents and then it was torn away to create the hole. Just a small outside, outside point. So who was the addressee? A. Louise Evans in the Segno organization in, in Los Angeles. And at this point, maybe I've shown this before, uh, I, I just don't remember. But when I became serious about collecting the group type uh, postal history, which ultimately became about 2,700 covers, I realized I'd need to keep track of it with a database. And this was back in 1985. 
and I bought a database, a simple database called Q&A, Questions and Answers. Uh, and I kept all the group type information in that database. Well, when the the collecting fraud came along, I, I continued building a database. And so what I did was search my fraud database for an addressee, uh, essentially Evan, just keeping it very simple. And and this is this is what the database brings up. The first cover is from Argentina posted in Buenos Aires, can't read the date of posting. It's got Argentine stamps. It's on a stationary envelope. It's a 25 centavos rate that's registered overseas. It's one centavo overpaid. And it's addressed to Senor Louis Evans. Well, that's Evans, okay. That's the addressee uh, who's a, 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 in the Success Club of Signo in Los Angeles. And I, I just show you the second page. It shows you the Los Angeles arrival. And it was a very modest cover. It was only only five bucks. Uh, so there's the first cover to uh, A. Louise Evans. Okay. Uh, here's a second from Mexico at a registered rate. Somebody was buying something from the American Institute of Mentalism. Uh, here, uh, uh, by the way, yeah, it's the American Institute of Mentalism. Here's one from France, a military franchise cover. Of course, the franchise did not extend to overseas destinations. So it has all the franchise markings. It has the originator, very, very nice cover. And then a proper 25 centime stamp, which prepaid the uh, postage from France to Los Angeles. Here's another one to Mademoiselle Louise Evans, secretary of the Success Club in Los Angeles, registered from Paris. Uh, one of one of the few large city origins that uh, that I have in the collection, and the last one is a postcard from Monaco, addressed to A. Louise Evans, and and it's written in Italian, uh, of all languages, not French, not not English. So who was A. Louise Evans? Out of a collection of about two hundred and eighty covers, five are addressed to Evans. One from Argentina, where the language is Spanish. One from Mexico, where the language is Spanish. Two from France, where the language is French. And one from Monaco, written in Italian. The addresses note she, she is associated with the American Institute of Mentalism and the Segno Success Club, and that she was a secretary during the 1910-1916 period, if not more. The language evidence suggests that she was fluent in Romance languages and probably handled the desks for client, the desk for clients who spoke and wrote in these languages. We know that actually all of the people I collect functioned in all of the major European languages and maintained personnel with specific language talents to properly handle uh, their foreign customers. So this let's let's take a little closer look at the Monaco postcard. It was posted on July 28th, 1910 in Monte Carlo on the train that ran from Ventimiglia, Italy to Nice, France. It's got a French style traveling post office cancel uh, Ventimiglia on uh, Nice uh, uh, July 7th, uh, July 28th. Uh, and this French cancellation is uh, what's known as a convoyeur cancellation. And a, a little bit of information I learned at my first France and Colonies UK annual meeting at Leamington Spa many, many years ago. Uh, in Britain, these cancellations are known as the Wigglies. Uh, I don't know if that's still true, but that was presented then. There's a full message in Italian and a signal arrival in violet, here you can see the convoyeur cancellation quite clearly. And here's the signal arrival. It says received, and it denotes all the vehicles that signal accepted uh, uh, as payment. Uh, we have bills, we have coins, we have checks, we have drafts, we have money orders, we have express orders, foreign cash, and postage, okay? Uh, even though this is, you know, 1910, circa 1910, all forms of payment are are suggest are, are accepted. Uh, are really quite amazing. What about the Monaco postcard? The card is written in Italian, a Romance language. It is signed by Mantovani, Santina, and her sisters Pascalina and Glorietta. 
The sender is Santina Mantovani, born on November 1st, 1896 in Monaco. Her parents uh, lived in Monaco. Her father was a local public works contractor. Uh, her sisters and Glorietta were also born in Monaco. And, and the, the question is, how did the Mantovani sisters get to know about the Success Club? Uh, Santina was a few months shy of her 14th birthday when she mailed the card to Evans. The card ends with many beautiful thoughts and thanks for your support and friendship, which indicates that the young teenager had built a solid relationship with Evans. Was she just a friend or was she a client of the Segno Success Club and the Segno Scam? And I think it's quite probable that Santina and her family were clients of the Segno organization and quite pleased with the results they thought they had had been achieved with their membership in the Success Club. But they decided to communicate their happiness via a 10 centime postcard rather than a reverse success wave. Uh, remember with his success waves and membership in the Success Club, Segno claimed that clients' lives would improve in the areas of success, influence, happiness, ambition, health, wealth, peace, hope, and love. Quite an array of life's areas and the thing about that is there was a very high probability that someone would join the success club and something good would happen in one or more of those broad areas of their lives. And the key point is just because we do A and B happens doesn't mean that there is an association between the two, but many people don't realize such. Uh, as a species, humans are easily fooled, be it in Segno's era, or our own today. And I'd just like to go back a little bit and, and pick a case of that. And uh, I picked Linus Pauling, uh, who received two unshared Nobel Prizes, one in chemistry one and one in peace. Uh, but chemistry, uh, he, he did tremendous work in chemical structure and chemical bonding. And of course, peace, uh, he, he was uh, uh, crusading for peace during the early part of the nuclear age. But, but Pauling also championed the use of vitamin C in the treatments of colds and cancer, treatments that never manifested themselves in human medicine. Uh, he, he had such power and money that he set up a Pauling Institute and was actually studying uh, the, the treatment of, of colds and, and cancer by vitamin C. Uh, and he forced a proper double-blind placebo-controlled study in colds in Scotland, and it was shown vitamin C at one gram actually had no impact on, on colds. It was totally useless. And Pauling responded by they should up the dose to 10 grams. So he was, he was clearly fooling himself. Regarding Segno with the international males, Segno always had an endless clientele to appeal to, even if his current clients realized his scheme was a total fraud. There were many, many more people. He had the whole world and the power of the international mail system. So that's the story of Lucy and Santina, who most probably were members of Segno Success Club. Uh, this is the first time anyone has had a chance to meet people who were taken in by the Segno scam. Both were highly intelligent, well-educated, and of reasonable means. And A. Louise Evans seems to have been more than a simple secretary in Segno's operations. She was skilled in the major European languages and was a key contact for many of Segno's foreign clients. My question is, did she realize that Segno's success waves were pu pure bull? We don't know. So there's the famous portrait of Professor Segno, uh, on the left from about 1900, 1905. And at the right is the little vignette I showed you before. I just recently found out this year it was available in French in France. Uh, and, and I found one of these and I'd love to have one uh, on an envelope that actually went through the mails should such ever happen. So that's the end of the story. And I, I just have to thank Loic for joining me and providing a lot of new information for me uh, and, and a lot of excitement. 
we first met uh, sharing a mutual interest in the group type uh, from the French colonies. Uh, and, and I think, uh, uh, you know, things have gone really well between us. Uh, uh, and I, I thought, uh, you know, I'd, I'd like to say that in some way to Loic, some, some way that had a French connection. And the thing that came to mind was the closing scene of Casablanca. That's Humphrey Bogart on the right and Claude Rains on the left. And in this last scene, they're heading off into the fog, off to Brazzaville to join the Free French under Charles de Gaulle. And Bogart says to Claude Rains, and I'm paraphrasing this ever so slightly, Loic, I think this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. So uh, nominally that would be the end, but, but something happened uh, while, while I was putting this together. And that is I noticed that my picture, you see those three dots uh, at the left? When this JPEG was sent to me, uh, it didn't have those three dots. And, and somehow while sitting around on my hard drive, it's picked up those three dots. And, and, and looking at them, I, I began to wonder, this glitch of dots has suddenly appeared in my JPEG. Is Professor Segno trying to contact me via a brainwave from wherever his spirit lies in the multiverse. I'd also like you to note my tie in this picture. It's derived from a photo of the birefringent pattern formed by paraminobenzoic acid when exposed to polarized light. And I couldn't help but wonder, is this a perfect antenna for reception of success waves? And there's the birefringent pattern of paraminobenzoic acid. And you can see all the colors in the organization are identical to my tie. What even made it more bizarre is while I was making up that slide, I was drinking a bottle of America's, oh, pardon me, uh, remind me tomorrow. That's Bill Gates. Uh, I was drinking a bottle of Snapple tea uh, it was quite warm and I, th this was quite cold. And Snapple Tea, just to entertain its customers, puts little facts, little factoids in the caps of its, uh, uh, of its uh, uh, various teas. And I happened to look at the cap of this, this bottle, the uh, bottle of tea I was drinking, and it says, brain waves can power an electric train. Oh my gosh, how things have changed. <laughs> Professor Segno would be delighted and pleased to know what brainwaves can do uh, today. So that's my story. Uh, I will be happy to take comments, questions, or anything else uh, about this little venture into the clients of Professor Segno. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Ed. That's really a tour de force, a set of research between the two of you. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing what you can find these days using the web. Yes, I mean, we couldn't, even 10 years ago, it would have been difficult. Yeah, it is. That is true. You know, you just go and you start pulling and then you can, you keep pulling and then you see where that takes you. And then you try to make sense of everything that you find. And I know that, I mean, Ed and I probably on this one, we exchange like a few emails every day for a couple of weeks. Hey, did you find this? Did you did you notice that? You know, and, and try to to get to some sort of conclusion. Uh, that, that, that is really a lot of a lot of fun. And I I greatly enjoy uh, all of that, uh, all of that work with uh, with Ed mentorship. Well, you certainly unraveled a lot between you. So perhaps if we can now switch over to Lois's uh, display event. Yes. Stop sharing and then Lois can uh, carry on. So let me share my screen and I'm going to just switch. Ah, I need to wait for Ed to stop sharing. Okay. Okay. So let me, I'm going to share. You're going to see yourself for now. And okay. Do you see something that says, um, Yes, 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 arrived. That's fine. Hide this a little bit somewhere up there. Uh, perfect. Okay, look. Yeah. I hope that those little stuff here is going to disappear as well. 
Bueno. Okay, so my talk will be around what I have uh, with pun intended name, circumnavigation and commerce attempts. Okay, Ed mentioned just earlier that, uh, you know, we share a passion for the group type, which is called, you know, known as navigation and commerce. So um, I'll, I'll get there through, through the presentation. Uh, going back in time, I think 1873-ish, uh, Gilles Verne had published his uh, Around the World in 80 Days, you know, the Tour du Monde en 80 Jours, um, very, very famous, you know, novel. Uh, the, the, think about traveling and traveling and, and, and everything was, you know, around the world. Um, obviously, the first circumnavigation had been done <laughs> now, you know, uh, 500 years ago, uh, at least by, by Magellan. Uh, there were some stamps here that I'm showing and, and blocks that were celebrating the, the 500 years of the first, you know, trip around the world, uh, some from Uruguay, some from uh, Monaco, and then some from uh, Liechtenstein, I believe. Um, so there was definitely, uh, as well with the, with the, let's say, you know, uh, expansion of maritime services uh, at the end of the, you know, 1800, early 1900, then there was more and more attempts from people as well, the philatelists also got into the, you know, the the passion for everything around the world and so let's try to send ourselves mail and and make it make it all right so what i want to do is basically go through some of this and then connect with with the group type on the second part of the presentation so the first part is really just a brief and incomplete overview of, of mail going through you know uh, throughout the years around the world uh, we'll see different different periods and then we'll go to two different uh, different covers uh, with with group type stamps um, so this first one here, and you will you will excuse some of the the scans of poor quality because I just got them on uh, you know download on Dell Comp on eBay doing some research, but uh, you have here one example that I believe has completed a round trip. Um, the postcard from from eighteen seventy nine. People use postcard because it was cheaper, of course, to mail it uh, to multiple foreign destinations. Uh, this one was sent to a German consul. Um, initially to uh, San Francisco and then Bombay in today's Mumbai in India, uh, and finally returned to Hamburg via uh, Alexandria. So it did a, a full, a full tour uh, going uh, westward, uh, and you have different different marks, different councils. Uh, Hamburg to start. There is uh, the San Francisco one here. You have Bombay, Bombay here. You have the uh, the post. Um, Egyptian post in uh, Alessandria, uh, and then so that's the full the full tour. So this one did this one did work, and I I take it as a as a good example of you know efficient German engineering uh, because 1879 this postcard went around the world and, and came back to uh, from Hamburg back to Hamburg. Uh, well done, you know four months efficient you know postal service. Uh, pretty, pretty impressive. I found a second attempt in, in 1892. That is what I would call relatively crude. Okay, uh, you can see the way everything has been, all the addresses have been written here by the initial sender uh, to Mr. Crempo, you know, uh, in Napoli, or, or no, via Rua della Napoli in, 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 in Roma. And then if he's not there, then Yokohama. And if he's not in Yokohama, then Boma in Congo. And if he's not, if he, if he's not there, then go to Nicaragua. And then if he's not there, come back to Portray in Belgium. Um, that has very little, some little chances of success. Uh, the letter was actually uh, rejected and returned to sender. It was uh, here. It was not, admit, not accepted and, and returned. He didn't leave the city of Courtrai. Uh, you know, it basically from the 2nd of September back to the 3rd of September where it started and, and the post office, you know, rejected it. Uh, and even if the post office had accepted it, it would have traveled probably eastward to Yokohama and then westward to Congo, uh, and then further west to Nicaragua and then back to Courtrai. So it would have gone like in both directions, but never done a full, a full round trip. So that's pretty, pretty crude attempt. 
something maybe a little bit better plan, uh, beautiful writing, handwriting on this postcard, all of the addresses are ready and, and so the person asks uh, the different recipient to to note where it arrived and and, and when it was uh, mailed, you know, to the next destination. But this one also didn't really travel. Um, I don't know if it was uh, simply rejected arriving in um, in Amsterdam at, at the beginning and then sent back to London. But this one didn't travel very far. So there was everything, you know, series of addresses here, mostly for a, what I would call a European tour. Um, Beautiful piece for sure, but it didn't. Uh, only the first address was was ever used, and then none of the you know two, three, four, five, which should have matched those here, were, were ever put on the on the card. And I don't know if that's because there is here a party, so you know left um, hand stamp, meaning that maybe that the initial recipient could not be uh, could not be reached, and so that looks to me like a, like a company, you know, uh, Winter and Company in uh, in Amsterdam. So most likely they, they would have existed still. Uh, actually, all of them are you know companies, uh, not individuals. So it's it's quite quite weird. I haven't been able to read and decipher what's on the side here, uh, but this one was basically there is a stamp here that it was just returned to the sender uh, at the address shown on the cover. So they you they took the address that is noted here at the end that was probably the the sender so the, the post office here understood okay that has been sent by, by this person and we're going to send it back to him it didn't mm-hmm. do the tour um i like the, the the final writing here made travel safely and soon return <laughs> it, it probably came back sooner than expected but didn't travel very far Moving on a few, uh, here is another, I'm going to say another example of, you know, successful German engineering, uh, quite also a lot of different councils on this one, but this one went from Munich, uh, but it left Munich in November um, 1897 and came back, uh, well, six months, a little bit, of, a little bit over six months later, six and a half months later in June uh, 1898. Uh, having traveled through Singapore, so let me see if I can. No, there are some Singapore cancel here, uh, Hong Kong and Kowloon here. There was a Munich cancel initially. Then there is some New Orleans here, etc. There is another one from this is I think Munich, Munich. Uh, that's San Francisco. There's a Liverpool cancel. There is Ponsos in uh, Nicaragua, I believe. Uh, and this one is Lisbon. So it went through a succession of cities and probably effectively did the tour going eastward as well as so Singapore, Hong Kong, coming through the Pacific to San Francisco, by land to New Orleans, going down to Ponsos in Nicaragua, then from there, uh, traveling to Lisbon, uh, Grand Bassa, and then Liverpool. So quite an interesting, uh, or maybe Grand Bassa first and then Lisbon, uh, most likely. Uh, that would have been the normal way to cross the Atlantic back. Uh, so that's a pretty, pretty impressive uh, round trip. Um, so prove that it was possible. Uh, in that same category, what I have seen as well were quite a lot of, uh, of similar postcards. Uh, and the common thread of all of this is that they were sent by uh, people who were practicing uh, Esperanto. So, you know, that kind of... Um, universal language. Uh, so this one, I think on the left here, you see the, the, the front and back uh, was a successful, you know, uh, tour du monde, you know, uh, round trip uh, around the world, um, going from, from Italy to France and then to England to Uruguay, crossing the Andes to, uh, to Chile, and then coming to Prague and, and Italy. Uh, I don't know exactly how the letter went from from Chile to to Prague, but let's hope that it traveled <laughs> westward. Um, so that's a, that's a pretty pretty interesting pretty interesting view. Um, and then these other two, I just showed them here because they have some interesting uh, some interesting you know group of stamps, very organized. Uh, you can see the different addresses, and there is a name that comes through these quite quite frequently from uh, Carlos Charrier in Montevideo. Uh, I have seen 
maybe dozens or hundreds of cards with with the name of that person. Uh, there is quite a quite a following. Uh, there's somebody at the door. Too bad. Too bad. Uh, Twenty five years later. So what what happened in between the, those periods is that the the postal union, the, the UPU, uh, in nineteen twenty five decided to put an end to the practice of sending multi address postcards for for the mail. Uh, but you could always take the mail and and move it through. Um, so the the, air, the beginning of aerophilately, you know, opens the door to some quite interesting, I would say, commercial shenanigans. And here we have uh, we have an, an initial view of a uh, you know aerogram from from Air France, and you can see that uh, initially it was sent, I think, to uh, to Brazil. Um, from Brazil, it went to. Uh, it went to New York, and then it continued because there is not just those two views here, but there is more. Then it went from from New York to New York to Brazil, and then Hong Kong, or vice versa. I don't I don't remember. And then from Hong Kong, it went finally to uh, to Paris. So it is stamped at different stopover from from the flight, uh, probably carried by the pilots from from Air France, and then they would go to the local post office have. The stamps put on, and then you know uh, the post office will cancel those stamps, and then they will carry the mail, you know, as they continue their their flight. Um, and to effectively confirm this, what we see is that there was actually uh, the commercial service from Air France was selling those uh, those covers. Uh, here it says, you know, we have the pleasure to send you, you know, uh, and close the Tour du Monde cover that you have, uh, you know, purchased from us in September. Uh, and the trip went as, uh, as planned, Paris to Toulouse, to Natal, to New York, to Hong Kong, to Marseille, to Paris, with the dates. Um, and they have, they mentioned that they have additional, you know, covers that are available and that they will be delighted to, you know, provide them to the, to the collector. Um, so <laughs> I found quite, this quite, quite interesting. And obviously, uh, we all know that the, the practice of having uh, such covers uh, stamped as you know uh, Air France planes went went around the world continued with nothing else than the Concorde. Uh, and here we have, uh, for example, four covers that went you know through multiple stops. Uh, there was that that practice at some point that the, the Concorde will take people for a, for a tour du monde as well. Uh, you know, and, and stop, and then, you know, you will have stamps and cancel at every every stopover. Uh, you can see those, the first one here is Paris to Le Caire, to New Delhi, to Singapore, to Bali, to Sydney, Nandi, Honolulu, Las Vegas, Nassau, Paris. Uh, this one here is Paris, Rio, Igasu, uh, Ile de Pax, Pasco um, Island, Easter Island, Fiji, Chiang Mai, Bangkok, Sana, Luxor, and Paris. So fantastic, fantastic trips. Um, and that's actually quite a quite a long journey, but all of those were were not really, not what I called you know, mailed through the post. They were stamped at the local post office and then carried in the Concorde, you know, to the next to the next stop. Um, still quite collectible, I think. And and I'm going to have a little question here for all of you. Um, bit of trivia: in 1996. Uh, the Concorde F uh, B T S D, um, so Bravo Tango Sierra Delta. Okay, after having you know completed quite a few Tour du Monde uh, round trips around the world, uh, was painted in a very original blue livery. Does anyone know what it is or remember it and can tell me what it was? Any idea? Pepsi. Pepsi. Yeah. Yes. Look at this. And I find it quite shocking for a French person, but yes, it was. Uh, and it's a, it's a very, very beautiful, uh, beautiful sight. Um, and that's all we'll say about this, uh, this amazing plane that uh, both the Brits and, and the French used for quite, quite some time. Um, sadly, to a, not to a glorious ending, but a beautiful plane, nevertheless. So after this very brief and short overview. Let's get into, you know, my area of uh, of passions or the group type. So we're going to start with a with a cover where we're going to have quite a few, you know, uh, mixed ranking, and that's what's going to tie to uh, to the French colony. 
uh, cover going from, from Bombay to Mexico City, uh, a journey of, of 18 months. And I think this one traveled to the, through the mail, but also in, in some different ways as well. We're going to see that as we go, as we go through. So here is a cover. Um, you can see that quite originally, um, it's uh, so label printed papers. So it gets the five, five centim rate or the one cent rate uh, for printed matter. And it was initially sent to uh, Mrs. Uh, Leroy and Papillot, journalist. Uh, in Madras Pondicherry. Um, it was sent from, uh, from Bombay. Um, so here it's printed. And then you can see that there are other stamps on it. Um, they stamp from French India, uh, five centim group. There is a five centim group from Indochina uh, with an iPhone console. So there is a Japanese stamp here. And then there is a US stamp here. Uh, you can see the cancel from Los Angeles. You can see the Japanese cancel here. You can see the Pondicherry, you know, and uh, cancel here. The same here, uh, and all different cities that have been, you know, struck out: uh, Pondicherry, Saigon, Shanghai, San Francisco, Mexico. Um, so that data travels through different places. Obviously, the the mix of of, uh, of cancels here on the front and the mix of addresses don't really match. So we have a Los Angeles cancel, but a San Francisco address in the US. So clearly the mail not didn't travel from those places through through the post. But let's let's take a look in more in more detail. There is actually a second um, a second item that's similar to this one, uh, and I got this scan from our friend uh, Ron Bentley uh, from the. Society of Indochina Philatelist, um, very similar, okay? Same handwriting, um, await arrival, so the, the general delivery kind of mail, uh, post restant in French, Le Juan Papillo journalist, and same kind of succession of addresses, Saigon, Shanghai, San Francisco, City of Mexico. Uh, you can see different, different councils as well, so the same. Indian stamp, the French India, Indochina, Japan, and, uh, and US. So very similar to the letter. Uh, more expensive because this one is at the, the postcard at a 10 centim rate versus the printed matter at 5 centim. Um, and we know of a third item that is similar that was sold a few years back by, uh, by Lugulum Philatelic. I don't know who owns it. Um, I don't have a good scan of it. Uh, I contacted uh, Thierry Lalevé at Le Denon, but he didn't have a, a scan of, the, of that item that he could provide. So if somebody has it, please share it with me. So let's take a look and see what we can learn from these covers. So the first, what do we know about the, you know, the addresses of those letters? So Le Roi and Papillo, journalist. So, I found that there was effectively uh, two journalists, Henri Papillo and uh, Lucien Leroy. Uh, and here you can see the, the, the not self portrait, but the portrait made by each one of them or the other, okay, um, that left France in early 95. Uh, here they have uh, the first, the number one of their en route you know, on the road kind of newspaper that was published in Nice in February 1895. And it seems that those two gentlemen decided at one, one point in time in their life when they were drinking in, in Paris that they were going to just leave and travel the world and write articles, you know, publish a local newspaper throughout their, their voyage. So I kind of look at them as a, the early influencers, you know, a little bit drifters. <laughs> but those kind of people who decided, hey, let's go and travel. We have no money, but as we get somewhere, we'll figure out a way to, you know, get some money by selling advertisement in a newspaper we will publish, and then we'll have subscribers, and then this way we'll be able to, uh, to keep traveling. Um, it actually did work quite well for them um, because they became quite famous, and then different newspapers were actually announcing their, their arrival uh, because it was quite, quite rare. Uh, and then they were writing and publishing the, those newspapers en route, uh, typically a bilingual kind of, uh, kind of issue, you know, with if they were in, in 
uh, in Shanghai, you know, they would write in Chinese and maybe French and English, or in, in Italy, they wrote in Italian and French, and et cetera, et cetera, in Japan, in Japanese and, and French. So quite, quite interesting. Um, and though they finally, you know, having left France in early uh, February 95, they were 1895, they were in Nice. Uh, and then from there they left to Italy, and you can see that uh, more than two years later they were finally arriving in San Francisco. So, what did they do during those two years except living the good life and traveling? Eh, they wrote a few articles in in their own newspaper, and they sent themselves some mail. So let's go back to our cover here, and so showing you the front and, and back. So they were actually whenever they travel. I found that they were typically um, hosted by local kind of French associations or, or, you know, like Chamber of Commerce and things like that. So here they were in Bombay, probably they had been invited by the French Patent Medicines Association in Bombay. Um, and they used their, their stationery uh, or their, 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 you know, envelopes to, uh, to mail themselves some, some, I don't know, printed matter. Maybe the letter was empty, I have no idea. Um, but this is clear that this one left Bombay uh, the 23rd of January. Uh, and it has a half Hannah postage stamp here, uh, you know, the, uh, on, on the envelope. And from there it went to, uh, to Pondicherry. Uh, it traveled with the, the local, you know, the Crown Mail service uh, arrived two days later. And they, probably went to the local post office, got their mail, put, you know, throw the, the Pondicherry uh, address on it and put Saigon, Cochinchina. And they added a five cent, five cent team, you know, uh, groups type from, uh, from uh, uh, India, French India, and mailed their, their letter and the postcard as well with a 10 cent team <laughs> to, uh, to Saigon. Um, did they travel on the same boat? I have no idea. Um, <laughs> I don't even know when it arrived in Saigon because there is no, no hand stamp from Saigon on, on the letter. All we know is that Loa and Papillo were actually uh, in Saigon on February 21, 21st and 28th because they attended different meetings from the Society of Indochinese Study of Saigon. Um, so they got their mail and they traveled up north to uh, to Haiphong, where probably they posted it at that point in time to uh, to Shanghai. Okay, so we have um, we have we have the, the Haiphong uh, cancel uh, July, July twenty eight. Uh, send it to Shanghai. The mail traveled through Hong Kong on its way to uh, to Shanghai. So July twenty eight Haiphong. Uh, August 1st, Hong Kong, and then made it to Shanghai. Um, most likely, their same, same story, they went to the post office, got their mail, and they didn't mail it back from Shanghai. They probably took it with them to, uh, to Yokohama, to Japan. Okay. Um, where did they go in the, in, in the meantime? They visited you know, a bunch of places, uh, the Along Bay, Island of Manhattan, uh, Hong Kong, etc. They, they had a good life. I think they actually managed to have a really nice experience in, in the you know, 18, 1895, 96, 97. That must have been a fantastic, fantastic trip uh, at, at that time. Um, and then so they took the mail with them to, to Japan and they put on it the, the two cent uh, stamp. Uh, the cancel was quite quite a challenge. Um, so I asked a, a, co a colleague of mine uh, who speaks Japanese uh, to help me decipher it. And looking at the, the cancel on the letter and the cancel on the postcard, we managed to re, you know, decipher and put together this uh, this content that you can barely see. Uh, more or less on, on the two cancels. Um, and so that gave us that this was basically uh, sent from uh, Musashi in Yokohama, uh, the 30th year of the Meiji era during the first month and the 26th day and the second kind of collection uh, by the post office. So it was forwarded from Yokohama uh, on January 26, 1897. So that's 
the way we got we got to that uh, to that date uh, that matches what we know about their itinerary uh, they had arrived in uh, in Yokohama in early November and I know that they had spent a couple of months uh, easily uh, probably three four months in Japan um, you know, visiting the country, uh, working on their, they had some issues with the publishing of their newspaper. Um, they kind of worked with a, with a local uh, famous photographer to, for some illustration, though it took them a little bit more time. Uh, and they left actually uh, Yokohama in late January on their way to San Francisco with a stop in Honolulu for some well-deserved vacation, I guess. Um, so, then the mail arrived uh, in San Francisco. Uh, so on the letter, there is a note in directory. And on the postcard, there is a general delivery, February 15, 1897. Uh, though I guess both the letter and the postcard made it to uh, San Francisco pretty much at the same time. Uh, they went and got their mail, traveled south from San Francisco to Los Angeles. Uh, and there, they took their philatelic souvenirs and then put the one cent stamp from the US and mail those one last time to, to Mexico City. Uh, this time in July 10, uh, 1897. Uh, from what I know, uh, Henri Papillot remained in Mexico and he started working there uh, for a French newspaper. Um, and after a year, uh, Lucien Leroy uh, went back to, uh, to New Orleans and France uh, and I read somewhere that he had published the last final issue of uh, En Route that was dedicated to uh, New Orleans and its French uh, colony. Uh, so I have never actually been able to find some of those journals um, on, on eBay or on, on, on Del Camp. I have seen some of those uh, early copies uh, on the site from the you know French National uh, you know Library, uh, some other you know um, organisms like that, but um, there was enough written about those two gentlemen uh, to help me kind of trace their their trip, and and so they left Paris in January uh, 1895. They were in Nice. In, in February, where they published the first issue of their newspaper. Then they went to Milan, from Milan to Rome, then to Athens, uh, with the number four being published there. Uh, then they went to Turkey and spent some time in uh, Istanbul. They traveled from Istanbul uh, through, uh, I don't know, Cyprus, and then Lebanon, or Syria, Lebanon, uh, Jerusalem, back uh, south to Cairo, uh, Alexandria first, then Cairo, they spent I read that they had organized a fantastic dinner with a lot of, you know, famous local guests on the uh, by the pyramids. So they had a pretty interesting uh, lifestyle, <laughs> to say the least. Um, then from from Cairo, they had left, you know, and, and then uh, arrived in Bombay, and that's where they sent their first their, the mail that we have, you know, we have trace uh, trace of today. Um, from, from Bombay, they went, of course, to Pondicherry, uh, didn't publish anything there, but then went to, to Saigon. I know they went to Phnom Penh because they had, they were received by the, by the King Norum in, uh, in Phnom Penh. Uh, Iphone and Shanghai, those are as of known uh, stops. Uh, from there to Beijing, I believe that's where they published the number 11 of their magazine, Yokohama, the number 12. Then they traveled to San Francisco, Los Angeles, and then Mexico City, uh, which is uh, the end of their trip. So that letter really didn't do a full, you know, world tour, uh, but still uh, almost a good, maybe not a half, but a good, a good chunk from from Bombay uh, to to Mexico City with multiple stops on the way. Uh, so quite an interesting cover, not a wrong trip. Uh, so let's say another one. The next cover is as well with some, some mixed ranking. Um, and it went from, from Frankfurt to Switzerland. Uh, I think that's probably less than a thousand kilometers, roughly 500 kilometers maybe between the two, but it went through a 40,000 mile journey <laughs> and took 200 days to go from Frankfurt to Switzerland. Let's see how that happened. This is a, this is a card. Sadly, it is a little bit damaged on the, on the angles, but you do see um, all the different uh, stamps on this 
Um, of course, the reason why it called my attention was the pair of five cent stamps from Madagascar here, but it has also a lot of different allegories, you know, the German one, uh, Argentinian, the French, uh, that's a piece of peace and commerce. So pretty, pretty interesting uh, cover as well with multiple cancel. I think there was something like 18, 18 different cancels on this on this cover. Uh, it is quite hard to make sense of it, but let's let's see what it uh, what it looks like. Uh, this is the back, and it's actually oh, hold on. let me let me go back. No, this disappear. But, uh, no, but, um, so it was written by Paul Langer um, or Langer um, in, in Frankfurt uh, on May 10, 1901. And then you see that he had a series of, of different addresses here ready. Uh, one Gabriel Chabot on board the, the, the vessel, military vessel La Rance in Madagascar. Then uh, one André Le Red uh, from the first uh, Corps of Zouaves uh, in, uh, in China. Then Mr. Hector Berger uh, in Buenos Aires, and then finally back Mr. Paul Langer in, in Serie in Switzerland. Uh, and what it says at the top is that to all of the you know, kind people, uh, please uh, forward this using the address in the, uh, in the rank that is indicated, you know, and uh, thank you in advance uh, for your salutations. Uh, and so it, Mr. Langer had really prepared this quite nicely for his, um, for his friend because the way the postcard was, was set was that he had written basically the first address. And then the second one is that he had just put the names and then it was up to every person receiving the mail to basically add the, the remaining address, you know, the, the street and, and, and city uh, based on what was on the, on the verso of the postcard. Um, there was just one thing that Paul Langer couldn't forecast was that his third addressee, Mr. Le Red, uh, who was with the uh, Zouave, you know, the military uh, French expeditionary corp of battalion in China. Actually, by the time the mail arrived in China, the battalion has left China and was back in Algeria, which was its regular uh, headquarters. And what did the military you know, postal service do at the time? They, well, it's for Mr. Lored. They didn't really read the mail and realize that Lored was supposed to forward it to <laughs> Argentina. So what did they do? They sent it to Mr. Lored in, uh, in Algeria. Uh, that's why we have you know, stamps from, from France here with, uh, with the Alger books canceled on top, uh, using at the time, um, I don't know, I think Retro Reveal, which has now been replaced by a Postmark Reveal uh, website, you can actually, you know, play with the colors and then it helps to read most of those cancels and you can see there is a variety of them um, from Majunga, from well, Paris Etrangers, of course, the second, the second date and then Majunga is next. Uh, there's a bunch of things from uh, Hong Kong and, and uh, Singapore, there's a base office council here, so from the uh, Chinese Expeditionary Forces. Yeah, there is, of course, some council from Buenos Aires. There is a military council from, from France here in China, uh, Trésor et Postes Armées. So very interesting trip for this, for this poor postcard. Um, but obviously, as well, it didn't complete the, the, the Tour du Monde, the round trip, because it went from First here, it went from Frankfurt to Paris in May. From Paris, it traveled at the red line uh, to Majunga. Uh, it was then sent back. Uh, I think it went to it went through uh, Aden. Then it continued towards uh, Singapore and China. In China, instead of going further east, back to you know. Uh, to Buenos Aires, 
it sadly was sent back to Algeria. So it took the, <laughs> the line back. <laughs> that, is, that is quite sad. Um, to Algeria, where it was in, in September. Uh, and from there, early October, it was sent to Buenos Aires. Buenos Aires, we have a, an arrival um, in October, and then it is sent back in early November to Syria, Switzerland. So that's, that's an impressive trip. But also not a not a full you know circumnavigation, not a full round trip. Uh, but that is actually a much longer journey than you know a full you know circumference of the Earth, uh, only twenty five thousand miles, and that later went. If I tried to do the calculation, probably around forty thousand miles, uh, you know, through through those two hundred days. Uh, so quite quite impressive. And. What's beautiful uh, about those kind of letters is that you can always, you know, what I mentioned earlier with the, the Lucy Gauthier story, you know, when you get one little line, you can pull and pull and pull and see what, what it, where it brings you. Uh, so you can always go a little bit deeper and do some, some additional research around all of, you know, the stamp, the name, something, and then you know that, okay, well, this is what the... The, the French aviso uh, La Rance looked like. So this one is from the, the Durance, but it's a very similar uh, similar vessel, the same the sister uh, sister ships. Uh, you see that same kind of uh, vessels on a on a French stamp here with uh, with Victor Segalen. Um, this one is, I think, Le, Le Meurthe, so the third uh, sister ship in the in the series. Um, when you look at more at the first Zouaves and uh, the core expeditionnaire in, in China and the Boxer Rebellion in the, you know, 1900, uh, you get all of those also, you know, interesting, uh, you know, base office cancels and et cetera. Yeah, there is the, the Singapore to Hong Kong cancel uh, on, on different postcards. So you can always go and, and, and connect different things. And so depending what your, your interests are, there is always like some sort of intersections between that area of the of philately that interests me and maybe what what you guys are more more interested in uh, quite quite amazing what you can what you can find actually and so to conclude here i'm still looking <laughs> for that that elusive cover or postcard that is franked with at least one group type stamp that would have completed a true circumnavigation none of the covers i had earlier from germany went through a French colony. Uh, the two that I have seen, uh, the one from Le Roi de and the one from Mr. Langer, uh, that went through French colony, mostly through, through, you know, uh, through Madagascar in one case and through India and, and Indochina and the other, uh, didn't complete the full uh, circumnavigation. I still believe for me, those two items are, are exceptional, uh, very, very original. And as you can see, you know, they, they bring you a lot of uh, a lot of pleasure with the, with the research and what you can what you can find about them. So that is my my story for today. I think yes. Any questions? If anybody has any questions, I'll have to unmute themselves. <clears throat> yeah, Loic, uh, I have a couple of uh, well, a comment and and then a a question for everybody actually. Uh, one of your early postcards uh, went to the Winter Company in uh, yes. someplace in Europe. Mm -hmm. And the Winter Company, had, I think, had its major headquarters in Washington. Yes. And you see lots of mail to the Winter Company in Washington, including group type. I'll, yes. I'll check my database to see how many group Oh, the, yeah. I, I know you, you had quite a few, and I have quite a few myself. Yes. Oh, probably. okay. Yes. Uh, another question, and this is something that that someone just asked me uh, the other day, uh, and and I'd like to ask of everyone. One of your postcards showed a a, a, a collector's hand stamp, a red heart with H L in yes. the heart. Yes. And I was wondering if anyone knows who that collector was. I, I've seen, I would say, dozens of covers. Yes. With that hand stamp, yeah, but I, that I, little I, little heart with the H and the L slightly off, stuck, stuck, yes. stuck yes. together. Yes. yes, it is. It is found in quite a few cover from that time. Yes, I don't uh, know. Who any, it is. Anybody know who it is or no? Okay, I just thought I I try. Uh, 
uh, a collector from from Atlanta actually just sent me an email on that one. So, yeah. I'll see if I can find somebody because we're going to go later this week on with Wu, uh, meet with some of the some of the French, you know, STEM dealers. So maybe I'll ask and if some one of them can tell me something. I don't know. The, okay. Maybe maybe Jean Francois Bon might know. We we can we can check that. I shall stop recording now.